just Welcome to DIY Solar and Wind. It's a little cold outside, so I decided I was going to take everybody for a little tour to Kalamazoo Air Zoo. It's an air museum, and uh, we got a lot of airplanes from long, long ago. Airplanes everywhere. And I have a guest speaker who's ready to go. And this is Kevin. Hey, good, uh, hello everybody. Um, well, we are in the midst of the uh, 100th anniversary of our involvement in World War I. So I thought we'd talk about an aircraft from World War I. And behind me you can see this is a Sopwith Camel. And the Sopwith Camel was originally a British pursuit aircraft. Uh, they came out on the Western Front. Actually, the Royal Navy was the first one to use them in May of 1917. And then by June of 1917, the Royal Flying Corps begins to use Sopwith Camels. Now, it is a pursuit aircraft, a type of aircraft that wasn't around at the start of the war. The aircraft comes about because everybody's trying to figure out a way to counteract reconnaissance aircraft, which are gathering information. Reconnaissance aircraft also help spot for artillery, make the artillery more accurate. So you have to find a way to go after those aircraft, and that's what they start to do with a new type of aircraft, which we call a pursuit. So obviously a pursuit aircraft, you can see on top of the cowling, it's got a couple of machine guns, and so they were armed to be able to go after enemy aircraft and try to either shoot them down or damage them. Those machine guns on top of this one are Vickers machine guns. They're belt-fed. <laughs> now, this stop with Camel is a sort of a, a, let's call it a late fourth, early fifth generation pursuit aircraft in World War I. Pursuit aircraft come out in the summer of 1915. This is now early summer of 1917, so they've made progression. So what's unique about a camel and people find often interesting is the engine. This engine, and I'll move around here a little bit, the engine is a rotary engine. It's not a wankel rotary, so automotive people don't get confused. It's a rotary engine, meaning, as you notice, as I turn it, the entire engine will spin. The reason that they were doing this at the time is because a normal radial engine, which is an air-cooled engine, looks very similar to this, radial engines at the time would overheat. You couldn't get enough power out of them before they start to overheat. So a way to overcome the overheating problem is just to spin the entire engine like you see here. Now we have an air-cooled engine that's not overheating, and a rotary engine will produce good, reliable power. Despite a lot of myths and rumors about rotary engines, they're a very reliable engine for their day and age. This particular engine is a Clerget rotary engine. Clerget was a French company, but the British liked to use this engine. It produced about 130 horsepower, and they wanted to use it on camels, so they get permission from the French to license build Clergés as well. Um, now, a couple of different things about rotary engines. One is it's a total oil loss engine which means as the engine is operating, it's consuming fuel, but it's also consuming oil. Because it's a little difficult to get into some of the details, but the oil and fuel mixture is fed through the hollow crankshaft into the crankcase. And then from the crankcase, it's fed up into the intake valve. So if you know about basic engine operation, this is a little different. Because the fuel and air mixture is in the crankcase, it's then fed into the cylinder. Obviously, if you think about it, wow. how do you put fuel in with an engine that's also got oil and not dilute the oil and have lubrication problems? So the oil that they preferred to use in rotary engines was castor oil, which is a vegetable-based oil. comes from the castor bean. Castor oil is a superior lubricant. Motorcycle people will know this. Castor oil is really good. High-performance engines, castor oil is very, very good. So that's what they use for a lubricant in here. So that allows the engine to be properly lubricated without losing the oil sort of tension that you need to lubricate parts. But that castor oil will also remain unburned as it goes through the combustion process. And that castor oil will come out the exhaust valve, which because it has a fixed crankshaft, the exhaust valve can open in the bottom here and allow that exhaust to go out underneath the aircraft. So rotary engines were quite unique. Uh, they were originally designed in France in 1908. This is aerial rotary engines, and they will be used throughout World War I. And again, this is a great example of one of those. 
you look like you have a question. Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> so that's a unique part of the aircraft that uh, you won't see in every type of World War I aircraft. Um, let's move around a little bit. The aircraft's been basically built from scratch, more or less. This is a hybrid. It's a reproduction using some authentic World War I parts, like the engine, the machine guns, and a few other things. So you'll notice it's uncovered. The, the Erzu has yet to cover this. It would have been normally covered with fabric. Back in World War I, they would have used Irish linen, which is pulled over the ribs, and then it's, it's varnished or painted, and that makes the, service, uh, the surface impermeable to air, so the air will flow over the wing versus through it. This is mainly spruce. Spruce is tough but light. There's a little bit of ash in here. And then the wood that you see up here is real thin mahogany. Wow. And that's just to provide some structure right around the cockpit area. Other than that, all the rest is going to be covered over in fabric. And you can see fabric down on the back part of the fuselage as well. And then we'll go around the side here a little bit. give you a better view of the back here. Now you can see a little bit into the cockpit area and what it looks like from behind. You have a fuel tank here in the back. You have a, also have an oil tank. Remember, it's a total oil loss engine. So while you're flying, you're going to be using oil. It uses about five to six quarts of oil an hour. And there's about seven and a half gallons total that you're going to have for oil capacity. And then again, you can see the two machine guns there in the cockpit. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. And then you may have noticed part of the markings back on the fuselage here. Um, this is going to be put in the markings of uh, William Barker, who is a Canadian pilot. Uh, he had 50 aerial victories total in World War I. He had 46 of them in one single stop with Camel that he flew for almost a year. And that's what the markings are starting to replicate here. Um, so that's an amazing feat. Most aircraft in World War I, to have one survive for almost a year, to get 46 aerial victories in a single aircraft is quite a feat. Um, and he was able to do that actually both on the Western Front and he flew a little bit on the Italian Front between the Italians and the Austrians where he got the bulk of these victories. So that's what the markings are going to be on the aircraft. So what else do you need from me? That is amazing. Thank you for being a great instructor. You bet. Thanks for having me. Kalamazoo Air Zoo, Lower Michigan. Have a nice sunny day. <laughs>